Thank you for auditing the always positive New Music Review Show hosted by a French professor who tries to, on every Thursday, release a video of a lesser known group. Now, due to the fact that I have to record around a baby's sleeping schedule, I'm going to be releasing this Thunderground Thursday on a Friday. And I'm just checking in on you to talk about the band Tapir. T-A-P-I-R. After the, the animal, uh, which is, uh, let's see here, I found a definition of it. Uh, similar in shape to a pig with a short prehensile nose trunk. So that little goofy animal is going to be haunting your nightmares and this video. Now, when I was thinking about how to sort of frame this album, you know, like, what does it make me think? And I'm going to sort of say some stuff which just ride with me here, because some of it's going to sound weird and maybe even racialized, and that's okay. But what I'm thinking is, this music reminded me a lot of times of different English music that I like, to the point where... I mean, like, only like two or three people recommended this band to me. Like, normally for Thunderground Thursday, I have a lot of groundswell. Just a couple people said, hey, check it out, and I checked it out, and I immediately liked it. But what everyone said was, it's kind of radio heady, and it's kind of Black Country New Roadish, right? And I think you kind of mix in with that, maybe a little bit of Robert Wyatt as well, and, and another influence, which I'll talk about in a second. And so it made me realize it's kind of a... English greatest hits, you know, like a greatest hits of England, England's newest hit makers, right? Now, obviously, let's caveat that because England is not England any more than France is France or America is America, right? It's a very diverse thing. These guys are English, Black Country and Road is English, the same as Little Sims is English, the same as freaking Ian Drury and Dave and Seal and Harry Styles. The diversity of gender and ethnicity and race of English music is almost as great as it is anywhere in the world, except for perhaps the United States. But what I'm talking about is a kind of pale Englishness. And I say that as somebody who is very pale. And I'm not pale from England. <clears throat> I'm pale from New England. But what I mean by that is, is not just that it's music made by people who are white, uh, but it's a sort of nerdy, earnest, intellectual approach to music. Presumably, one would be pale and not tanned, because instead of going to Ibiza and partying, maybe you're down at the library uh, reading a book, or maybe you're playing video games or watching a movie. And obviously, this kind of uh, pale Englishness really appeals to me as a pale New Englander, right? Culturally, socially, the outlook really does lend very well to my approach to the world, right? It reflects me in ways that other music doesn't. So a lot of the times when I review music, especially when I review hip-hop, I'm reviewing people whose lives, experiences, and perspectives are just totally alien to me. That's why I say I'm, I'm like a tourist. I'm just, you know, it's as though I'm studying 17th century French literature, which is what I got my doctorate in. But with these guys, you know, same thing with Radiohead, same thing with Black Country New Road. Even though there's an age difference, I'm younger than some of them, older than others of them, there's a sort of shared understanding of things, a sort of shared approach. When, when I think of you know, like forebears, like, like ancestors to this kind of pale, pale Britishness, I often think of a song like Anyone for Tennis by Cream or the entirety of the album John Barleycorn Must Die by Traffic. That kind of almost folksy, almost connected to a sort of older sense of England, sort of a pre-colonizing England. And, and when, I, when I think about what makes pale British music good, obviously musical excellence is part of it, very engaging, well-thought lyrics, and a certain level of intelligence. And this is what we get in Europe, because the European education system is much better at producing people with a wide breadth of knowledge, uh, as opposed to... Anyways, the American system is great for producing excellence, but the... The, the mean is not very good. Whereas I would say uh, in England and France and most of Europe, the mean is very, 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 very high. So that kind of smarty pants intellectualness, the musical excellence, and the weaknesses can sometimes be strengths as well. You know, abstraction to the point of solipsism or irrelevance. Perhaps that intelligence can lead to an, a certain amount of preciousness, like like in this album, like I don't think they used the word prithy, but they could have used the word prithy at a certain point. 
if we take the, the two cardinal examples that I'm, I'm taking from, and I know I could have done this video and just said, Radiohead meets Black Country New Road, check it out, it's Tapir, what, what, what? And maybe I'll do a, a maybe I'll release that as a, as a YouTube short or something to get you hyped for the album, because that's not a bad comp. But when we really get into the excesses of those two groups, this album happens to not possess either of those excesses. I think Radiohead, it's searching to the point where it can sound like navel-gazing, not to me, but to many other people. And Black Country New Road, it kind of verges on the musical, you know, making it sound like it's a musical as opposed to an album. Now, this does flirt with that, but we'll talk about that soon. <laughs> While I was sitting here and I was thinking about pale Britishness, is that offensive, by the way? Please tell me in the comments. I don't think it is. I think I'm, I'm contextualizing it well enough. Uh, but I, you know, it's very important not to equate pale Britishness with Britishness itself. But there is, I think, something to be said for pale British culture. I, I, but, <clears throat> Jesus, man, whew, <laughs> the self-doubt that just overcame me as I said that. Seriously, like, 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 you know, when you get, um, like, uh, like adrenaline shots, you know, like, like, I'm just flooded. Like, is this whole concept bizarre and problematic? I don't think so. I think we're almost set. But one more pale British person that I think this singer really reminds me of. And, and it's funny because so often I was like in the Tom York zone and all that. It's actually Eric Idle of Monty Python. Now that I've said that and you listen to this album, you, <laughs> I think if you had to have any other person singing all this music, initially I thought Robert Wyatt or Tom York. No, I think Eric Idle could do this entire album front to back and have it work. Now, in order to really describe this album, uh, I'm going to use their own description. So I'm going to sort of annotate their description. There's no need to rewrite the wheel, as I like to say. South London-based six-piece, first of all, South London, uh, Y'all have too many football clubs over there. Is that Crystal Palace? Is Crystal Palace in the South or is that Fulham? God. As a guy who only really watches French football, it's confusing. Because, you know, we got one city, one team. I, I, I think it's Crystal Palace who's down there. Anyways, uh, six piece tap here. Six piece is interesting because I read that and I think it's going to have the fullness and extravagance of Black Country New Road. It doesn't. It's actually very restrained. At times there's like drum machines. There's a lot of drum machines. At times it feels like it could be a trio or even a duo. The Pilgrim, Their God, and The King, My Decrepit Mountain. That's the title of the album. Uh, the Pilgrim, Their God, and the King of My Decrepit Mountain follows a three-act structure, followed by Heavenly Recordings as three four-track EPs. Already we have, <laughs> we got the goofy dorkiness that we're talking about. The sweet-ass dorkiness, you know? And to be, to be clear, this whole concept of pale Britishness, uh, it, there are plenty of non-white pale British creators, right? It's, uh, it's more of a mentality. It's more the lack of time in the sun than it is the uh, amount of melanin in your, in your bloodstream. Just give it up, Sky. Just go with it. It's fine. You're telling me, I hope. Yeah, this three-act structure with these EPs, it's like a whole idea. It's like this concept album. And you're thinking, what is the concept album? Well, if you look behind me, that's basically the concept of the album. Like right there, I think I did basically, hey, <laughs> Tapir, if you're watching this, you're welcome. I just illustrated your album perfectly. A solitary traveler, an ambiguous red creature known as the Pilgrim. If you know who that ambiguous red creature is, feel free to tell me in the comments. That's what we call engagement. <laughs> He's facing the wrong way. <laughs> and later I'm going to tickle him. A uh, red creature known as the Pilgrim on a journey across a mythical landscape of eerie forests, stormy seas, injured birds, and idealized idolons. Idolons. A fantastical offbeat fable carried along by Gray's crisp, heartfelt vocals. Gray, I suppose, is the name of the singer. I don't know if that's his first name or his last name, so I don't know. I try not, I, I guess I could have looked that up. It's not Spalding Gray, that's a guy who's been dead for 20 years. Anyway, someone whose name is Gray. It is wild to think that, like, is there really only one male vocalist on this album? Because the range that this singer has, it makes it sound like many, many other people. The project at times feels like the musical equivalent of the paintings of Henry Darger, Henri Rousseau, or Philippe Guston. 
an American, a French, and a Canadian artist, respectively. So that's interesting, because they're trying to place it in sort of a romantic, naive vibe. And that's what they're trying to go for with the paintings of Henri Rousseau. Just for fun, I looked up if Henri Rousseau ever did a painting of a tapir. I mean, he probably didn't, but he did sometimes do animal scenes, kind of exotic animal scenes. And for whatever reason, the cursed internet, okay? Before AI, <laughs> you could still type in stuff, and some, this is available for purchase from Etsy. This is not an original. <laughs> okay. Someone made a Henri, Henri Rousseau. They took the backdrop of one of his most famous paintings, subbed out the animals that existed with a tapir and multiple beagles. Again, hey, tapir, if you're out there watching, you're welcome. I just found that for you. I suggest you, I suggest you find the artist and, and you tell them, hey, can, can this be our t-shirt? But it's an interesting idea, right? That they're trying to go for, for this kind of romantic, fascinating, far away story of this mythical creature and these lands. And maybe that's something that I sort of associate with this kind of pale adventure story. You know, like I often think of English countryside as being sort of desolate and kind of damp and like romantic, but in, in kind of a dreary way which I suppose is at, at odds with, uh, with Rousseau. But this album isn't very dreary because it's mostly in the ocean and around mountains. What is the actual story of the pilgrim? I don't know. I, as far as I can tell, he goes somewhere, he sees something, and then it's over. <laughs> That's, as far as I can tell, it's like, the, it's like the good parts of Lord of the Rings, the parts without the fighting. Uh, but I think that review actually, or that description, undersells what makes this a great album. It's likable and very very sweetly melodic just the melodies are great the instrumentation is great the singing is great i enjoyed it the first time i enjoyed it more the second time and i enjoyed it more and more and more on subsequent listens it's just a very likable thing and in many ways the kind of super nerdy three-part four-part structure of a thing and the pilgrim and the guy that we wear the red things on our head at the concert that we go and and you, if you could break down the arg game of uh, the character the two, why am I doing an Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation? You know, like all that, uh, it's fine, but you don't need any of it. It's just, just, these are some sweet tunes, bro. All right, so for the stamp, I'm gonna, <laughs> hey, am I insulting this band or complimenting this band? Damn, I am. You know, it's, I did that Kanye video and I just, I'm a mess. <laughs> I've gotten like 30,000 views in, in the past like week. It's been insane. And I know this video is, is probably going to get less than a thousand. So if you're one of the ones watching, you are what we call in the business a real one. You are a real sweatpant. That's what I call my hardcore fans who are here for Thunderground Thursday. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's made me doubt uh, and question a lot of things about myself and the channel. Which is why doing this video is awesome. Because I get to introduce you to the song, The Nether. Good and goofy sides of this album. I just love it. You know, it's the overly precious story that could easily exist on its own. There are, I swear to God, rain sticks. Rain sticks on this song. And it's a good song. Do you know how hard it is to put a, have a good song with a rain stick? Whew. You know? I mean, everyone goes to the store that has rain sticks and plays with them and goes, hey, that's kind of cool. And then some of us are confused enough to actually buy a rain stick and then you have just like a stick in your apartment. <laughs> it's like, look at the rain stick and you increasingly grow to regret your decision until eventually you just put it on the curb and someone goes, hey, cool, a rain stick. And the process continues. But they actually use it quite well, you know, to create some atmosphere with this nice guitar and this really sweet instrumental thing to set up, I mean, it's instrumental intro to set up, uh, don't use the word thanks guy, to set up this beautiful, catchy, kind melody. Can I say kind? It feels kind to me. Just this high, sweet voice that goes high and low. So much character. Gray, gray first name something last name, or first name something, last name gray. Just has such a dynamic voice that can be so... Like, you really get wrapped into it. I saw it face to face, a creature calling no from the nether, dancing her with grace, shakes my head and tears my leather. Now, that was, um, truthfully, the best thing I've ever done on this channel. Also, truthfully, 
a terrible hatchet job of the song. I was trying to hit the melody the way that it works. Imagine that, but like really well done, especially the way it goes, tears my leather up top. It sings it super high. And then we get this chorus, which is sort of my least favorite part of the whole album, but also maybe something that's growing on me the most. So it's really hard to tell this. It's cold. It's dark. Throw your bones into the ancient water. It's cold. It's dark. Throw your bones into the ancient water. It has a little bit of that kind of musical feel, which, you know, I'm always, I'm always, I, I never know what I think about musicals or musical feels. You know, that's one thing I'm really thankful for Black Country New Road is they really push me to accept a lot of that kind of soundscape. Um, but I was just traumatized by having ever seen Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, like, can we have a class action lawsuit for anybody that's ever seen that, right? Like, he's got a lot of money. We should be paid back. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, think that was the, I, think, I think that was the worst thing I ever, I've ever seen in my entire life. A high school performance of Jesus Christ Superstar. Man, that was rough. It was this beautiful, like, post-second verse. And oh my God, I'm going to get so many comments. Sky, I love the Jesus Christ Superstar. You do you. I'm, I'm just being a prick. Uh, there's this beautiful instrumental falling apart bit in this, uh, after the second verse. These little discordant sounds and it comes back slower and there's some percussion. And I just really like the vibe here, you know, and it stops and kind of restarts. And then it beeps out because this is the end of phase one of the four part phase of the EP cycle. <clears throat> And it's beautiful. And that's, to me, the entire album in a, in, a, in a nutmeg. And I would really suggest listening to that song and coming back to it. I'm going to go through the rest of the album uh, a little bit quicker. Uh, we have Act 1, The Pilgrim, some discordant sounds, some detuned guitars. This is maybe the most Black Country-ish sounding song on the album and not the best, right? Like, I don't think there's like a direct correlation between sounding like them and being good. I think it's more just some of the just the super British sounding voice and some gentleness and kind of a nice little jig and the way the horns are using and even some whistling. From atop a green hill, the pilgrim did peer a call from the distance. I am the pilgrim? Mr. Sky, can I turn around now? Shut up, pilgrim. <laughs> okay. On a grassy knoll, we'll bow, we'll bow together. Uh, it's weird because I suppose in the rest of the world, the term grassy knoll does not immediately make you think of a president of the United States having his brain blown out the front of his head back and to the left. So that's cool. So I guess it is. I guess there are grassy knolls that are not exclusively places where the third shooter was located. And this is the weird, funny thing, right? Because it's, it's got these like Casio sketchy drums and it's got this sort of Radiohead style drum machine thing going here. It sounded so much to weird fishes like my to my daughter that she was like, come on, what, are they getting royalties? And I hear it, you know, I get that, I get that, but really it's, it's not that close. It's, but if you told someone write a song like weird fishes that isn't exactly like weird fishes, that this might be what comes up. But still, the way that he sings is nice high singing, very restrained, lots of nice layers. I can change, I can change. A little simple guitar solo, nice horn solo, and it fades out. If out here lies irrelevance, I will lay down in remembrance. They're this close to a prithy. <laughs> so close to a prithy. From a mockingbird falls a feather, I must follow into the nether. It's sort of a hero's journey of the pilgrim, I think, you know, he's sort of like going out and experiencing nothingness. And we'll see in the third act what that nothingness might be. The next track is called Swallow, the name of my favorite Japanese baseball team, Tokyo Swallows. Uh, I, I think I've alienated every member of my audience by saying that. <laughs> Another chintzy kind of drum machine, odd rhythms here, lilting horns, a beautiful little, okay, now sometimes I read my notes and I get annoyed because I say things in my notes that I didn't do. <laughs> so this is what I wrote in my notes. Do a precise breakdown of the instrumental bit at one minute and 20 seconds. So hey, I apologize to you, I didn't do it. My baby's great, but she's hungry all the time. So I was like feeding her all morning, I guess I didn't get to it, um, but very, gentle singing and calls my name, the sacred hunter, maybe a little bit of Beirut-y, 
similarities with the singing and the voice. Very pretty singing, high and low. Then we get to the Stamp the Nether, which closes Act 1 of the four-part Act 1. Then we get to Act 2, Their God. The oceans and seagulls. I don't think these people are from Brighton or from Liverpool, because uh, they said they're from South London. Are there seagulls in South London? I don't even know. Where's the Thames? The Thames has to be south. South London must be south of the Thames. You can tell me. Tell me, okay? Tell me these two things about South London. It's, it has to be on the Thames, right? Because everything is on the Thames if it's in London. But then is a Crystal Palace. Okay. Uh, the beast stays still. All this stuff with this beast and more rain stick and seagull sounds. And then we get to the Broken Ark. You see, I have this picture here, right here. And what I like about this picture is it actually reminds me of that Henri Rousseau style that they were talking about. This is made by a guy named... It's called Old Man Noah. I have to move... Uh, by a, a printmaker named Jules. And it was made in 1948. And it was hung in my father's house you know, when he was eight years old, right? And passed on to me when, when he died. And it's, I remember seeing this when I was a kid, really enjoying this, this painting. Uh, but it's of Noah's Ark. And when I talked about The Smile, when I talked about Rap Ferreira, when I've talked about two or three other things in the past year, Noah's Ark and the Great Flood keeps coming back. So, this is officially a declaration. We are living in the Noah's Ark arc of popular culture. Waterworld is coming back, baby. Okay, the fear of Waterworld, global climate change, you know, the, the, the reality of global climate change means that this biblical myth is rising in importance. Nice kind of dark, minor, descending sounds. <laughs> it sort of, okay, Jesus Christ. I really like this band, but I'm going to say something that makes it sound like I'm making fun of them. Because the only pictures I've seen of them are actually them wearing red hoods. So maybe they're not pale. Maybe they're tan. I don't know. Uh, maybe they're of, uh, you know, non-European descent. I don't know. I've only seen pictures of them wearing red stuff. So I actually picture them, okay, I actually picture them as te tapir. Tapirs? What's the plural of tapir? Whatever the plural of tapir is, because I've only ever seen them with red masks over their heads, I don't even picture them as human beings. I picture them as tapirs. Point is... I'm complimenting them, <laughs> but it does sound, this song sounds like a soundtrack to like a really cool indie video game right up until the guitar comes in. And then the guitar saves it and puts us back into rock town. Uh, nice bass and tinkling piano, great atmosphere. Little like, some of the details that make it Radiohead are sometimes the vocals are very, like the vocals here are very Tom Yorkish, but there's this kind of Doppler effect with a kind of blared out guitar. Bang, 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 bang. Bang, bang, which is just very nice. Love, di love desolation. It's you on a hill. There's like this image of the hill. I don't know if the hill is safe from the storm. It has to do with the monster. It has to do with the nether or the abyss. I don't know. Beautiful strings and horns. Sort of like aggressive singing, like aggressive Tom York style here. Uh, and even some nice oohs. Like, I can't help you out now. Gymnopédie. The funny thing about being a music cricket, you know, this is my hobby I picked up in the lobby. I'm a full-time professor, but this is my hobby. It's a great hobby. Um, probably, primarily because I get to discover bands like this, not just because I get to have <laughs> weird anti-Semites say that I, I understand them. <sighs> Anyways, um, is that it's not that hard. <laughs> it's not that... It's it, like, it used to be hard, but if someone names a song Gymnopédie, you just type that sucker into Google, and then, I mean, you have to have the discernment to figure out what's what. So Gymnopédie is two things, okay? It's an ancient festival from Sparta, like Gerard Butler's, you know, awesome gay movie, but like, of like, naked men dancing, like, that's what a Gymnopédie was, and it's also the name of three pieces of piano music by French composer Eric Satie. So, which one is it? Is it the naked dudes or is it the French penis? Okay? <laughs> Pe pianist. It could be Spartan penis. Is it about Spartan penis or French penis? Okay? And so I listened to the Eric Satie piece. Again, it's so easy. 20 years ago, this would be impossible, but it's so easy. And it's definitely this. The t have you heard it? Have you heard Gymnopédie numéro one? Oh my God. 
<laughs> numero one. Numero un is incroyable. That's excellent. What a beautiful piece of music. This is totally in that realm. It's a nice tender little waltz. Now it's guitar led, not piano led, but even with the little ominous shades that, that Satie puts into his music, it's exactly that. It even reminds me a little bit of Wolf on the Door by Radiohead off of maybe their second or third best album, Hail of the Thief. Uh, beautiful guitar or tremolo, maybe even a little Neil Youngish in his sort of like soft, dancey vibes. There's this beautiful bit with a choir with like many voices. And so, yeah, it's definitely named after Eric Satie and not named after a bunch of naked men dancing on the beach in Sparta, right? Or just dancing around in Sparta, okay? So it's not about that. All right, let's check out the lyrics. Dance, but naked on the sand. I lift my withered hand at the festival of man. <sighs> All right, fine, fine, fine. It's both, it's both. That's cool. It's a neat trick. It's a neat trick. They did it. I was, I was so positive. And then I read the lyrics. Dance butt naked and sad at the festival of man. And then we had this amazing chorus. My favorite lyrics on the whole album. I've been told in heaven the rooms are filled with mice. There's breadcrumbs in the bed sheets, and Jesus has head lice. I don't, I don't get it, this kind of like anti-heaven slander, but we need more of it. You know, we spend so much time in rock and roll trying to make hell and the devil seem cool. Why not make Jesus and heaven seem lame? That's a way more interesting like vector to, to choose, you know? Oh, I, I say vector. I remember when I was in third grade, they were doing head lice checks, and I didn't know what they meant. I thought they said headlights, like on a car. And so Stephanie Green walks up to me and she says, Sky, do you have headlights? And I thought, well, my, there's headlights on my parents' car, so yes. And I said, yes, I have headlights. And oh my God, she went, Sky has headlights! And they went running and <laughs> ran away from me. Anyways, beautiful, very moving. Maybe more into the Black Country New York area here with the dynamics. And again, this is where I like to imagine them just having Eric Idle sing this song. Because he was a great singer, right? Always look on the bright side of life. The song about Harry Nilsson. Um, God, that whole contractual obligation album. He has a couple of songs on there. And the next track is called Idolon. Remember how I said they're nerdy and intellectual? Well, there's positives and there's negatives. And the only negative is if you don't like it. But if you do like it, if you're down for it, I'm down for it. I'm down for that Eric Satie naked Spartan thing, dude. I'm pretty sure the Spartan penis or French penis is going to be the best joke I tell all year. Okay, I, I want to see that. <laughs> I want to see Spartan penis or French penis trending on Twitter and X like now, you know. Uh, but Eidolon is just, it, okay, wait a minute. Now all of a sudden we're in America. I don't know what's up, but now they've taken us to America. This reminds me strongly of the king of pale Americans, Bill Callahan and Smog. Weirdly enough, weirdly enough, I was at the gym and I'm scanning through the free movies and there's a Godzilla movie that I've never seen. Versus, I think it's Ghidorah? Is this? No, what's its name? Hidora. Hidora. I've never watched it because it's against the smog monster. And so I'm thinking about smog and then I see the smog monster. Yo, that is the best Godzilla movie. Have you seen it? It's insane. It's like animated and action and like, it's awesome. Anyways, totally surprised by that. Nothing to do with this. So in this very smog-like song, this very Bill Callahan-like song, we had this whole idea of Id Id Eidolon which apparently is an idealized person or thing, a specter or a phantom. Now, I mentioned my dad's passing. He was obsessed with Plato and obsessed with ideas and stuff like that. So part of me is happy. Part of me is sad that he's not here because I would like to talk with him about it. And then part of me is happy because I could never get out of a conversation about this kind of stuff with him and it usually went south and got super weird. Anyways, Eidolon comes from the Greek, Eidolon, uh, which comes from the word form. Like literally in my house, you couldn't say the word form. Even if you were talking about like, did you fill out that form? My dad would just start going on some kind of weird incoherent lecture about the theory of forms. <laughs> it's very funny. Did you fill out that um, uh, uh, pamphlet, brochure? <clears throat> very sweet, very cool. I put you on a pedestal. So it's sort of about the specter and it's about idealization. And it's great because... Idealization is one of the worst things that happens in love. It was, it was, it, I'm recording this on Thursday, releasing it on Friday. Wednesday was Valentine's Day. Don't, don't idolize the person you love. They're a human being. Not only do they fart, like they, they fart nasty. They do. They do. 
that 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 that, that girl you never thought could just be you know she farts and she has mean thoughts tons of mean thoughts you know all the time okay so just think about the person that you love the most and who you think is just the most wonderful awesome person and then imagine them shit you know what i mean that's good that's actually good that's good for love act three king of my decrepit mountain <laughs> This is such a weird video. The The subtext is uh, 10 minutes ago, the Marseille game started. So, so you know, that's, that's the, the team I support. Um, so I'm like, I don't want to rush this video because this video, you know, art means way more than sports because you can't lose at art. But I am excited to see that game. So I'm like, n I'm, <laughs> I'm trying so hard not to rush that I'm slowing down and talking about farting. The King of My Decrepit Mountain, that's act three of this four, three part, four part series, starts with like meditation bells. Again, it's like they went into one of those shops that's only open around Christmas that sells a whole bunch of like Eastern hoo-ha, not East, the, the, the things are real, but the way that Westerners incorporate them into their lives can often be hoo-ha. So like meditation bells, rain sticks, etc. And yeah, I don't really want the story anymore. I just want the rock, like just give me the music, but it's, it's not so intrusive that it's a problem. The next track is Untitled, very kind of jam band jig, little pauses in here. And then there's a female singer, which is nice. And then again, more great lyrics. Really their lyrics are great, especially when they're not, I think their lyrics are best when they're not trying to follow the story of the pilgrim. And my throat is sore from old regret, so I'll sing for you instead. That's a beautiful lyric. And then this female singer who has been doubling sings her own verse. And then the male singer comes back. I suppose Gray comes back with a little bit more swagger. The next track is called My God. Very simple Casio drums. Do they have a drummer? Do they have six members and no drummer? I wondered the same thing last week about who. Who was I wondering that about? There was another band. I couldn't figure out if they had a drummer or not. Weird stuff. Um... Oh, it was um, the band with the hot dog on the cover. Um, what, what are they called? The band from Pittsburgh with the hot dog? Tell me in the comments. Um, anyways, guitar strums. This feels like the radio hit. Reminds me a little bit of Everybody's Talking by Nilsson. And obviously, it seems as though it's basically a cover of My Guy, That's My Guy, written by Smokey Robinson. Also, I can't help but think of Pavement because the song Shady Lane, oh my God, oh my God, oh their God, it's everybody's God. It's a, right, that song that's all about like the consumerism and, and the dream of material comfort in the suburbs as being our God. And then this song is about material comforts and consumerism as being our gods in part. In part, it's about that. I don't know if that's on purpose. They might not even like Pavement. I don't know. But the consumerism angle is pretty clear there. Uh, iPhone 6 versus pickup sticks. I watched by Hugo Boss. Maybe it was Maybelline. I'll put you at a loss. That's my God. That's my God. See, Blur, that's a band that's not, pa that, that's not pale British music, even though they're pale British dudes, right? I'm thinking of that uh, Top Man song. He's Hugo and he's Boss, right? So again, it's not all pale British music is white and not all white British music is pale. I'm still on it. <laughs> We're like 10 minutes in, in, into the first half and I'm, I'm still questioning myself. Oh my God, I haven't, speaking of God, I haven't asked you to like my video yet. To subscribe, to smash the like bucket, it's too late now, but you should. And if you like this video, put an AVAA anywhere in, the, in your comment and I will heart that comment. Also appears to be an attack on God itself. So there's, there's what human has turned God into, which is consumerism, and then on God itself. Isle of White and Isle of Blue and Orange and Green and Red. So Isle of White is an island in England where Black Country New World recorded their last studio album, where what leg is from, uh, where Hendrix recorded. And, and so, you know, you think of White, but then Isle of Blue and all of that. And then Hurricane Me and Hurricane You, 200,000 Dead, that's my God. So there's the cruelty of the natural God and then the absurdity and grossness of the human-made consumer God, kind of all mixed up together there. But then it ends up being spiritual. Don't let it break you. And then it ends with a song called Mountain Song, Led Zeppelin cover. It's very strong. 
bad joke, not about Zeppelin cover. Uh, it's all about like building a mountains out of the things I wish I owned. So it seems to be sort of about this loss and regret. And now I'm starting to wonder if this whole story isn't about consumerism because this third bit's about consumerism, but I don't think it all is, but maybe it is cool kind of like jazzy jam section. I think some real drums here, which are quite nice. So I guess they do have a drummer. Maybe he's just getting Phil Selway out, out of the, uh, out of the picture here. Very, again, sort of Beirut-like, which is the highest compliment you can give for integration of horns into gentle rock music. Almost like a millennial feeling of like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, I build myself a mountain made of things I wish I owned. Mudslide made of arrows carries and takes me home. A tree line holds my body. A tree line holds my bones. The tallest structure standing, voicing only echoes. It's seven minutes long. It's got a lot of millennial woos and a lot of prayer bells, and it's great. So that's my review. I think this is some great music. I really enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's worth missing the first 15 minutes of a footy game. And uh, I've just, anyways, it's Elmo. I really, I, I really didn't want to buy Elmo because Elmo is like the end of Sesame Street and Grover is so much cooler. Uh, but I realized I was being selfish. You know, if my daughter likes Grover, and Elmo is always with Grover now in Sesame Street. What am I going to do? Impose my values of Sesame Street onto her and prevent her from enjoying a character that's made more for little children than Grover? This is what I'm doing instead of watching the same game. All right. Until next time, tell me what you thought of this album because I think it's great. And props to whoever it was that told me to check it out because I did. All right. There's the comment. Uh, there's the comments. There's the camera. There's the camera.